Whoa, whoa, who ordered Mario 64 music? Get that out of here. <laughs> Better. So anyway, the point of this video is to show you that you can teach an old dog like Growlide some pretty old tricks like surviving a flare blitz. Now the reason I say it's a pretty old trick, actually before I get to that, what led me to start investigating down this path was a fairly recent development, the discovery of something I call rollout storage. Basically, if you run a rollout to completion but one of the hits comes against a Mimikyu to break its disguise, you'll get a big damage boost to whatever your next attack is, even if it isn't rollout. So with that damage boost in mind, I was able to prove that by taking advantage of it, we could get so much damage that it makes the game overflow or wrap around at one specific spot. But then by looking through all the minutiae of the damage formula, I noticed some other spots that had the potential to create overflow as well, until I put everything together to choreograph the battle you've just seen. A relatively simple setup that takes only four turns with neither a rollout nor a mimic cube anywhere in sight. As far as I'm aware, this should be possible on all the games going back to the original black and white. All the relevant mechanics have worked the way they do ever since then, and this mechanic has just sat there latently, waiting to be discovered all this time. I don't actually have those Unova games to test with, and the setup will have to be a bit more roundabout in order to work there in particular, but if you want to try it, knock yourself out. Or don't, because that's the whole premise of how you test for overflow. Now in order to see what's really going on here, we need to talk about how damage actually works. Here's basically how the damage formula is arranged, and that's been the gist of it for over 20 years, back to the very beginning. These various letters each have a certain meaning. And there have been some implementation details that have changed as the franchise moved across different consoles, architectures, and game regions, but these are, and always have been, the main steps involved. Of course, there are also sub-steps involved in getting to each of those components in the formula. For example, let's start with the attack stat. The Mewtwo that was involved in this test battle didn't actually have max attack, but it did come pretty close. Here you can see its summary screen showing a 346 up there, whereas a perfect stat for a Mewtwo would be 350. The components that make up the stat have been pretty well documented over the years, and if you follow battling then you probably already know about them, so I won't bore you with going over it again, but they obviously break down to give a 346 in this case. Then when Mewtwo Mega evolves, the base stat changes to 190, and all the other factors stay the same, so at that point the raw attack stat changes to 522. That's our starting point. Now various boosts apply to different points in the damage formula, and some of them build directly onto the attack stat. For example, when Mewtwo snatched that belly drum to get to plus 6, that's a quadrupling of the stat, so it's now at 2088. Growlithe later intimidated that down to plus 5, but since Mewtwo had a free turn to waste during the setup anyway, the Intimidate was okay, and it could get back to plus 6 with a bulk up. Then when the ability was skill swapped to huge power, that also affects it at the point of the stat, so double it again and it's now at 4176. Just in case you feel like replicating this result yourself for some reason, keep in mind that there's only a 50-50 chance for Gardevoir to trace huge power at the start of the battle. Sometimes it'll trace Synchronize off of Mew instead, and that's just a complete waste of everyone's time. If that happens, probably the best way to handle it is to end the battle right away and start a new one so you can try again. It's not such a big deal to throw it away at turn 1. I've had other setups that required going 20 or even 30 turns before they got to the pure coin flip. Now that 522 stat, in order to reach it so conveniently, you need a Mega Mewtwo X that's level 100 and almost, but not quite, at its maximum. But for other reasons, I didn't want a level 100 here. I wanted a level 73 or 74 attacker. Turns out the easiest way to accomplish that is to let the Mewtwo be itself, but then have this Mew transform into it. When it transforms, it copies the raw attacks out of 522, copies the fact that it's already at plus 6, and it even copies the fact that huge power has been spliced into its ability slot. But there are some things that don't get copied. The one everyone always cites is that Mew keeps its own original HP stat in contrast to all the other stats. But you also don't copy the level, so Mew was able to get that 522 stat with all the bonuses on top, while staying at level 74. It's not really something people think about much, just because you never see very many battles where the Pokémon involved have level differences, notwithstanding random jank like fear, but it is a real thing if you give it the chance. Anyway, there's one last factor in play as far as this term. When Sharon comes in and transforms with its flower gift thanks to the sun, 
That's a 50% boost to both the physical attack and special defense stats for itself and its teammate. Obviously, the special defense doesn't matter when you're the attacking side, but the attack boost comes in a convenient package, so I'll take it. Once that kicks in, we arrive at the final effective value of the attack stat being used here, which is 6264. Then we have that P term, the move power. As you saw, the Transform Mew used Flare Blitz, that's 120. But it didn't just use Flare Blitz, it used it as the result of the move Me first. When you use Me first, as long as you outspeed the opponent, you use the same move they do against them. But your version of the move comes with a 50% power bonus, and that bonus applies in the step of determining the move power. So instead of being 120 power, it's using a 180 power Flare Blitz. As it turns out, that's the only change that applies to the move power on this particular hit. As for the defense stat, there's not much to talk about there. Growlithe at minus 6 defense drops to 1 point, and you can't go lower than that, so we're done. Now we can plug all these turns back into the damage formula. Work it all out. Eventually. And we arrive at a total of 699,064, right before we get to that X turn. It's actually a bit misleading for the sake of simplicity of representation. It's not actually just one multiplier, but several different ones which all get applied in a strict formulaic order. The first one that's relevant in this battle is the weather. Fire move and the sun, so we multiply by one and a half, right? Right? If you're used to the way humans normally do math and just carelessly punch buttons on a calculator, you might think the simplest way to do this is to straight up multiply by one and a half and be done with it. On the other hand, if you're more attuned to the limitations of computers and integer data types, and the clock cycle cost at each low-level operation, you might suggest breaking it up into two steps. First, multiply by 3, then divide by 2. Or, in a slightly different manner, divide by 2 and then add that to the original number. Those are both pretty reasonable ways to implement a modifier like that. But, as you might expect from a company that calls itself Game Freak, They've had their share of mechanics over time that were implemented in, let's just say, a rather freaky way. The actual way that the games implement a positive weather bonus, at least in these recent games since Black and White, is to multiply by 6144 and then divide by 4096. The reason they do it this way is to be consistent with an extensible system of multipliers that they use for all kinds of things. For boosts of one and a half like the weather, it's not really necessary, but take something like life, that's a 30% boost, or 1.3. This happens to be a bit unfortunate, because 1.3 is not a so-called dyadic rational. Now what that term means is that if you try to represent it as a fraction, and you insist on the denominator being a power of 2, which they do because it makes the division easier to handle, it doesn't matter what you put on both sides of the fraction. You will never be able to land exactly on 1.3 unless the denominator also has a factor of 5. But what they figure with their system of dividing by 4096 for everything is they can at least get pretty close. So instead of the life orb being exactly a 30% boost, it's only 29.98%. Maybe it's sad about being shortchanged out of that last 0.02%, but when nothing has more than 714 HP anyway, that margin isn't really enough to make a difference. Besides, even for multipliers that don't need to be that complicated, multiplying by 6144 and dividing by 4096 has the same effect as just multiplying by 3 and dividing by 2. At least that's the case in most everyday situations that you'd expect your Pokémon to be sent into. If you're going out of the way to engineer a downright path, logical use case, on the other hand, scanning for several possible numbers with the specific purpose of finding them that cleanly breaks down into smaller attainable factors, your mileage may vary, and such is the case here. When we multiply that 699,064 from earlier by 6144, we get this. But it might be more relevant to look at that number in binary, in which case it looks like this a few ones, and a whole bunch of zeros. Now, the 3DS was designed to be somewhat affordable to the end consumer. To that end, to cut down on production costs, Nintendo made use of a fairly dated processor, which was first made back in 2005. If that gets its job done, great! But digging into the low-level details of how it works, we see that all of its registers, which is where it keeps data for performing operations on, are 32 bits wide. Most modern processors, including the one in the Switch, have at least some 64-bit registers available. 
Now you can still do 64-bit math with 32-bit registers, or even 8-bit registers for that matter. You just have to break it up into a lot more steps and keep track of all those steps if you think that's worth the additional cost of computation. At least in this particular case, Game Freak didn't seem to think it was worth it. They probably figured if you're just dealing a couple hundred damage at a time, four billion ought to be enough for anybody. So anyway, we have this number, and it's time to store it in our 32-bit register. Whoops, there went that bit. Don't worry, it's probably gonna land in the distortion world, or maybe some other parallel universe. Maybe when we ever get Sinnoh Remake, Cyrus can go down there and pick it up, because it's clearly a much more significant figure than anything else he might find there. As for us, we just have to deal with what's left. As far as this register knows, the result of the multiplication is a rather mundane 81,920. Never mind that that's actually smaller than one of the operands to begin with. But that's just the multiplication part. We still have to divide by 4,096 now. Well, actually, we don't, because the system is nice enough to do it for us automatically. But dividing by 4,096 isn't too big of a fuss. It just means chopping off these last 12 zeros. And what's left in binary here, you know better as a nice round 20. And after that, we still have to deal with the random roll and the type resistance, both of which can reduce it further. To give you an idea of what's supposed to be happening, here's the good old showdown damage calculator. It's not programmed with the knowledge that damage overflow is even a thing that exists, so it doesn't try to implement that. And I've renamed a few of the options as things that are equivalent. But according to this, Growlithe should be on track to take somewhere around 500,000 damage. Obviously, that would be a one-hit KO. Even if we reverse it, let's put Mewtwo at minus six and Growlithe at plus six. That's still about 2,000 damage, way too much. In fact, let's try something different instead. Suppose we have a Shuckle, and it has the move Guard Split. It keeps using Guard Split on the level 1 Growlide, switching out and coming back to repeat the process until Growlide's defense is as high as it can possibly go. Likewise, we'll have something else use Power Split repeatedly on Mewtwo until its attack stat is as low as it can possibly go. Then just for the heck of it, I'll even get rid of the Flower Gift and the Sun. What does it look like now? There you see it. Guaranteed one-hit KO. There is no reason a level 1 Growlithe should be able to survive anything like this unless it's for reasons like Focus Sash, Sturdy, or Flash Fire. Except there is another reason, and that reason is the magic of Overflow. The actual damage range, if everything's been set up correctly, is 8 to 10, and as you saw in the battle, it was a 9. Unless there's a critical, of course. I guess if I wanted to be extra thorough in the setup, I could have replaced Golduck with a Zachu. Then instead of using a useless amnesia on turn 4 just to waste time, it could use Lucky Chain and prevent any possibility of that. But anyway, not only does Growlite survive, it survives by enough of a margin that even after it uses its own version of Flare Blitz to deal... one damage, it survives the recoil from that too. Who's a good boy? Nice doggy standing up to all the fiery abuse from that cat. At this point, you may be wondering about those previously documented convoluted setups involving things like our old friend Shuckle, this time with Power Trick to deal as much damage as you possibly can. Those figures don't quite hit 4 billion, so they can theoretically fit in their entirety within a 32-bit register. But knowing what we know now, it turns out that if you double-check the math on those scenarios, you'll find that they do in fact overflow in the middle of the formula. Granted, they overflow by such a huge margin that they're still dealing about a million damage afterwards, so it's still a KO and you won't be able to detect the overflow while you're playing, but they don't actually get credit for the full amount of damage they've been cited as. For what it's worth, if you're trying to concoct a scenario that maximizes damage while still respecting the limitations of register overflow, I've been able to demonstrate that the highest number you can possibly reach under current mechanics is 343,597,376. That figure assumes the numbers are even capable of working out nicely, and it's not readily apparent that they can. The closest that I've been able to get to guarantee that it is possible to reach is 343,597,200, which is a difference of 176 damage from that ideal landing spot. And there are a few possible ways to get there, but the easiest one I know of involves a level 88 Zangoose. Other than that teaser, if you feel like trying to replicate or improve on this result, I leave that as an exercise to the interested viewer. And 
honestly, if you got this far into the video and you're not an interested viewer, then what the hell are you doing still watching this? Okay, class dismissed. You can all go home now. Assuming that's not already where you are.